continue talking about the way the world is, why it is the way it is, and the character of the goddess. And finally, some advice for one who does not wish to fall into the traps of this material life. So why is the world the way it is? Well, a long time ago, back in the Satya Yuga, the first Satya Yuga. There was nothing like religion. There was nothing like human society with different classes and levels. Everyone was the same. Everyone was self-realized. And so they felt no need for religious rituals or sacrifices or any kind of learning. They were happy to just be. Huh? because this is the mark of a self-realized person. And the demigods, however, didn't like this. And so they went to Ambal, they went to Tripundri. Now, Tripasundri, you have to understand her character. She is always very favorable to the demigods. The demigods, after all, are her children. So, in the three forms of Saraswati, Durga, and Lakshmi, she gives birth to all the principal demigods. So, naturally, being the mother of the universe, she's partial toward her sons and daughters, the demigods. So the demigods weren't very happy because nobody was doing sacrifice. Nobody was doing puja. No one was making offerings. They were all completely satisfied. So they went to Ambal. They, they went to Tripura Sundri. And they told their problems. And she said, okay, I'll take care of this. So what she did was she told Cupid, uh, this is described in the Mahatmya Kanda of the Tripura Sundari. And unfortunately, uh, as far as I know, there's no online version of this. It's only available in hardcover. I happen to have it. Uh, of course, if you read Hindi, that's, that's available, but in English, you have to buy it directly from the publisher. Anyway, I have a copy, and this story is described in there. Now, who is Cupid? Cupid is lust, desire, and attachment. He carries the same weapons as Ambal, Ambika. And that is the, the bow made of sugarcane, the five arrows representing the five senses, the noose or lariat for roping and leading animals, and the elephant goad, the ankus. So she has these weapons and her child, Cupid, also has these weapons and he is very powerful and expert. So she said to Cupid, go to the earth and conquer the humans. Now what does this mean? Does it mean that he showed up, as it's described in the scripture, he showed up in a chariot and did battle with the humans? No, that's a metaphor. What happened is, over time, Cupid infiltrated the human society, lust, desire, envy, attachment, 
the urge to possess things and exploit them, greed, covetousness, and so on. So we have seen from the time of Satya Yuga, when human beings were pure, we have seen that they gradually become infested with Cupid's uh, qualities, his weapons. Uh, they become trapped by his snare. His snare is desire. So the human society gradually becomes degraded until nobody is doing their proper duty because out of lust they're addicted to exploiting others. And we see this, it's all pervasive in society today. Of course, this is Kali Yuga, so this is the worst time, the worst period in history. But it's going to get even worse. Kali Yuga is 432,000 years in length, and we're only about 5,000 years into it. Don't believe people who say Kali Yuga is almost over and we're going into the Golden Age soon. That's not true. That's not what the Vedas say. That's not what the best teachers say either. So what's really going on here is that the humans were tricked into worshiping the demigods. You might say, well, what does that have to do with anything? Because when people are religious, if they want something, They'll worship the demigods to get it. They'll do seva, they'll do sacrifice, homa, puja, and meditation. But now people have become so degraded they don't even believe in the gods anymore. And they really, even the people who are so-called spiritual, don't accept the homage to the gods. So... They just become lost, confused, and degraded. This is atheism, actually. Because the, the situation is the way it is, you know? We can't overcome it just by being in denial about it. We can't escape the duty of having to pay our debt to the demigods by performance of yajna, sacrifice, just by wanting it not to be so, because it is so. And those are the conditions in which we take our birth, in which we live in this world. There's nothing we can do about it. If we follow the instructions of the scriptures, then we can live a happy, peaceful, satisfying life. But if we rebel against them, the result is nothing but suffering. And we see the atheistic, materialistic people, uh, the greedy, acquisitive, controlling people, and they're miserable. They're miserable because they're always tormented by lust and desire. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that by associating with the objects of desire, lust develops. And because of lust, anger arises. And when one becomes consumed with anger, he falls down into the material pool and suffers. That means he gradually becomes degraded and has to take birth as an animal. That's the real meaning of it. And this is the way the world is. I mean, look at the world, huh? Everything and everyone is corrupt. Nothing and no one is what it appears to be. Everything is a scam. Everything is a cheating business. Especially anything to do with power, sex, or money. Isn't it? It's much easier to find a cheating rascal than it is to find an honest man. <laughs> this is just the way the world is. I could tell you so many stories, you know? But most of them probably better not told. <laughs> 
But I can tell you one from my own experience. You know, about 10 years ago, I had an ashram, or actually several ashrams, and a bunch of disciples and this and that. And then I found out that there was a small group of like three or four disciples who wanted to use my name and our reputation and our organization to establish a community in Mexico, which then they were going to use as a front for dealing drugs, you know, selling, transporting, and distributing. And luckily I found out about it and I put a stop to it. But then these same people manufactured uh, a whole scandal uh, and tried to smear my reputation. Well, it didn't work. <laughs> but you see, this is going on. And in every big organization, or even small organizations, this kind of stuff is going on. We all know what a front organization is. Like, when I started in this life, the first thing I did, my first career, was in music. And after I graduated from conservatory and made a little money in New York, I went out to the West Coast. And one thing led to another, and I found myself living in a small town out in the woods. It's called Forest Knolls, California. And Forest Knolls and the town right next door, Lagunitas, are, or were at that time, the hangouts of all the rock musicians. So the Grateful Dead was there, Quicksilver Messenger Service was there, Janis Joplin was there. I lived in Janis Joplin's house. And so I hung out with all these people. I was in a band, everybody was in a band. <laughs> and I know the music business from the inside. And you know, people say that the music business is like the mafia, you know? And actually that's not exactly true. The music business is the mafia. Let that sink in for a minute. There is no difference. So I saw a lot of people that got in trouble with the mafia and got whacked or disciplined, punished in different ways. And it made me see that the things that people consider desirable in this world are nothing but a boatload of troubles. Fame, money, power, beauty, huh? popularity, social status, all these things are nothing but trouble and pain. And you can't get out of it. You can't make it not the way it is. And the reason is because of desire. Because these things are considered desirable, people will do whatever it takes to acquire or control them. So this is the way it is, and it's because of Cupid. Huh? It's exactly the cause. Now, does that mean that mother doesn't love us? Of course she does. So she gives remedies. She gives ways to get out of the influence of Cupid. And that's what spiritual sadhana is all about. We are born with a debt. We are born with a burden. The demigods demand their due, just like the government can demand its taxes. The demigods must be paid off to get us our freedom. So we have to do this sadhana. We have to do the rituals. We have to do the exercises and devotions and meditations. That's just the way it is. That's just the way the world is. It's not my opinion or it's not anybody's you know, sectarian teaching. That's just the way it is. Even the Catholic idea of original sin is actually not that far off. We have to perform penance to cleanse ourselves, to purify ourselves 
from this original sin and pay off our debt to the gods. So then what? Assuming that we go through all that stuff and then we get our freedom, then what do we do? Well, how do we stay, first of all, how do we stay free from trouble? The best way is to simply live in solitude, to live alone. People are so addicted to society, they even calculate their identity in terms of the opinions of society, instead of by looking inside and finding out what they really are. Huh? This is tragic. But listen to some good advice from the Buddha. Formerly, this mind wandered about as it liked, where it wished, and according to its pleasure. But now I shall thoroughly master it with wisdom, as a mahout controls with his ankush, an elephant in rut. Delight in heedfulness, guard well your thoughts, Draw yourself out of this bog of evil, even as an elephant draws himself out of the mud. If for company you find a wise and prudent friend who leads a good life, you should, overcoming all impediments, keep his company joyously and mindfully. If for company you cannot find a wise and prudent friend who leads a good life, then like a king who leaves behind a conquered kingdom, or like a lone elephant in the elephant forest, you should go your way alone. Better it is to live alone. There is no fellowship with a fool. Live alone and do no evil. Be carefree like an elephant in the elephant forest. Good are friends when need arises. Good is contentment with just what one has. Good is merit when life is at an end. And good is the abandoning of all suffering through our hardship. So self-realization is the cure. Huh? It's the cure to all miseries. It's the antidote to all problems. And it means the end of uh, rebirth in this material world. So by all means we should follow the system of four yogas, karma yoga to pay off our debt to the gods, bhakti yoga to develop beautiful divine love for Brahman, raja yoga to realize that Brahman, and jnana yoga to enjoy and make this world a more beautiful place. Aung Tatsat, Aung Shakti Aung.